I want to extend a welcome from my wife. My, uh, we, we were in a season of transition, and we go out and minister, but we also found a local church, and it was just a matter of time before the pastor said, we want you to be our worship pastor. And so uh, she has other commitments, and she's not able to be with us today. And uh, just uh, because she loves me, I didn't have to bring all the kids with me either. So I've got, uh, I've got Stephen and Austin with me today, and I'm glad that they uh, travel with me, and they enjoy doing that, and they're a lot of fun uh, to have with me. But I just want to extend a warm welcome for my family. Um, today, uh, you know, I guess I'm not sure what you're expecting. <laughs> and what I mean by that is because we have a ministry called Refuge. How many know what I'm talking about? You're part of that. Uh, but pastor asked me to come and minister because he's on vacation. So I didn't come, to be honest with you, as a representative of Refuge. Refuge is going well. We believe God for what he's going to do and what he's continuing to do. And I would love to talk to any of you guys about anything you might want to talk about with that. But today I just came as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word today, and that's my, that's my total agenda right there. Matter of fact, when I go places to speak, yeah, I love to preach messages that encourage, inspire, that uh, cause people to believe God for great things, because I believe God has great things for every single person in this room. And there's a number of things, I'm just going to be real with you, I mean, I've preached a lot of sermons over the years, so I mean, I could just come in here and preach. This book is full of messages uh, and things like that, and so it would not be hard for me to just come in here and preach a message that I love to preach. But what I really came here to do today is, I said, God, what do you want us to hear today? I don't want it to be about me. I don't want it to be about what I'm passionate in and what I love to preach about. I don't want it to be about, hey, I have to to be this guy up here that I want. God, I want what you want for us today. And I believe that God has a word for, for someone here today. I believe that the message that has been stirring on my heart over this last week is for someone here today. And so I want to be faithful, and I want to share that message with you today. And it may be for more than one person. I don't know. I hope so, because I think it's a message that we as a church need to hear. But I just really want God to minister to the person and the people that really need this message the most, because I've been one of those people before. I've been in that place where I've come into church and I've just said, God, I need you to speak to me. I anybody know what I'm talking about. I believe there are some people here today that you came hungry and said, God, I need you to speak to my heart today. I want to tell you, you're in the right place. Not because I'm here, but because God is here and he has a word for you today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the the humbling opportunity to, to be able to minister your word today, to be able to just speak. Um, God, I thank you that you have something for someone to hear today. So Lord, I pray that I will be your mouthpiece and your vessel to deliver that in a way that we get it and that we respond to it and that it draws us closer to you. God, I just ask you to have your way, Heavenly Father, in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The space was probably about, I would say, 10 feet long and about 3 feet wide. And it was a dark space. It was a space that was so dark, you couldn't see the hand in front of you. Anybody ever been in a space like that before? Complete blackness. I'm not talking about last night when your eyes were shut. I'm talking about when you're physically awake, but you're in a room where you can't see a single thing. That's where I found myself that morning. That space, about 10 feet long and probably about three feet wide. I've been in that space before. So although I couldn't see a single thing, I knew what I was surrounded by. I was surrounded by a lot of books and a lot of clutter. And I found myself sitting on a stool in a completely dark space. 
It's a place that you would never expect to find your pastor sitting in a dark space on a stool on a Sunday morning after church hiding in the closet of my office. That's the place I was in. Hiding. The pastor who just preached a message. The pastor that just gave the altar call. The pastor that just prayed for people. I was that pastor sitting in the dark feeling so alone. Feeling like I was pretending and not understanding how God could use me. Why he would use me. Why wouldn't he release me? Why did I have to keep doing this ministry and being a pastor? Why am I still here in this place, walking on this earth? What good am I to these people? Because they don't know what I'm walking through when I leave this place, when I step off that stage. They don't know what's going on in my life. They don't know what's going on in my home. They don't know how really screwed up I am. But here's what I know, God. I don't know how you can use me anymore, and I don't want to be around people. I was that person. I sat there while people in my church were looking for their pastor that day because people want to talk to pastors a lot of times after church. It's just true. Everybody's got something to say. So I figured if they couldn't find me, they were just assumed that I was talking to somebody else, and it was really important. So important that I wasn't even in my office, but we had to find a private place to go and talk. But certainly they wouldn't think that I had abandoned or I had run or that I was hiding. Nobody would think that, right? Because what pastor does that? We don't do that. We're there for people. We want to hear your, what's going on in your life and pray for you and be there for you. No, 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 no. That wasn't me that day. I was in that 10-foot long eight foot, I don't know what it was, three foot wide, dark place, couldn't see a single thing, and just sitting there crying. Saying, God, I don't want to do this anymore. But people come looking, and I heard my door open up. Well, I don't know where he's at. He's not in here. And people were looking for me and talking to me. My own kids, have you seen daddy? Have you seen daddy? And I sat there listening to them trying to find me and not saying a word because I didn't want to be found. I wonder if there's anybody else in this room who has ever been in a dark place. You see, this isn't the faith-filled, tiptoe expectation message I preached the last time I was here. But this is a message I think somebody needs to hear today, that you're not alone. That other people have been where you might be at now. That sometimes we find ourselves in a dark place in life. The Bible is full of stories of people like this. There's one that really came to mind this, this week as I, as I thought about this. You know how I prepared for this message? I built a deck. Me and my boys, we finished the last board. We were determined to finish that last board before we came and left yesterday to, to drive out here. We stayed last night in Cedar Falls, and, and we were out there in the rain. It was pouring down, but I told them we are not leaving until this is done. I mean, now we were sliding in the mud on the ground, but hallelujah, when I go home, I don't have to put another board on that deck. It's done. And matter of fact, to be honest with you, to be completely honest with you, I probably should have spent more time preparing for this message, like sitting in a Starbucks or getting away and preparing. But I'm just honest with you. And so on Saturday, when that was my intention, or on Friday, I mean, on Friday, when that was my intention to go hide out somewhere and prepare for today, instead, I just worked on my deck. That's a confession. (laughs) 
And, but as I worked on my deck, I thought about this, and I said, God, what do you want to say? What do you want me to do? And, and he, he took me to this passage of Scripture that I couldn't shake. And to be honest with you, to be completely honest with you, I wanted to preach something else. I did. I even kept looking at different things and trying to get away from this today, and this is all I keep coming back to. So, hey, this is what you get. But I was in this dark place, and I think sometimes other people find themselves in a dark place, and I want to read about a character in the Bible that I think is an incredible man of faith, somebody we would not expect to be in this place. People in my church would have never expected to find me in my closet, and they didn't find me because I'm a good hider, but they wouldn't have expected me to find me in that dark place. Because I've seen good things happen in ministry. And I've seen God move. And I've been full of faith at different times. And I've seen miracles. And, and I've trusted God. And I've seen him come through when nobody else maybe thought he would. And I didn't know how. But I've seen God be faithful over the years. Nobody would expect me to be in that place. I didn't expect me to be in that place. You want to know the truth? I was the guy who said, I will never be that guy. And there I was, that guy. And there's a guy in the Bible who, who I'm reminded of like that. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we're just going to throw a couple of verses, I believe, up on the screen. Starting with verse 3, it says this, Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. I wonder if anybody's ever said that to God. You don't have to raise your hand. I wonder if anybody's ever said, God, I've had enough. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. I've never been suicidal. I think suicide's a really bad idea. I mean, no, that's a good thing that I think that's... Yeah. And I never put my family through that. But I've... I remember thinking, but I'm okay if I die right now. I remember praying for thoughts, God, would you just, you know... I'm driving on the road. I can't wrap my car around this pole, but if a deer causes me to have wrap it around the pole, then that's okay. And if you want to take my life that way, then so be it. And nobody will say it was suicide. You get it? It was an accident. Elijah's at this place, this dark place, and he's saying, Lord, I don't want to live anymore. I'm fed up. I want to die. But you're going to have to go home and read your Bible because I don't have enough time to unpack all this. But what I want to tell you today, this is shocking to me that we we're in chapter 19 and we find him in this place. Elijah saying, God, I'm hiding out. I'm on the run. I've traveled. I'm hiding under a broom tree. I'm just sitting there alone and I'm saying, Lord, take my life. I want to die. How does he end up in that place? Because let me tell you a little bit about Elijah. If you back up a couple chapters and read your Bible and go home and read it, this is what you will read about you will read about a guy who was taken care of by God that could trust God to the point where the birds brought him breakfast in bed. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. When was the last time a bird brought you breakfast in bed? Unless you call your little kid birdie or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, come on. He knew that God would provide for him. He'd take care of him. When he was thirsty, there was a brook where he could get drink. And guess what? Even when that ran out, he found himself going to a widow's house. And he said, give me some food. And she said, I don't have enough food. I got a slice of bread. I've got just barely any oil and flour. He says, feed me. And you will have plenty, God says, in your house. And that widow, in the midst of this drought for years, she always had enough and never ran out of bread or flour or oil or anything she needed to take care of her and her son throughout that whole process until the drought was over. Elijah saw that happen. Breakfast in bed by the birds. Fed by the widow. 
But in the midst of all this, the widow where she's at, her son dies. Elijah's upset about this. He's upset with God about this. Read your Bible. See how he prays and talks to God. God, why would you allow this to happen? But then he prays for the boy. He swoops him up in his arms. He takes him up to, to the room in which he was staying. And he lays over the boy's body and he cries out to God for, to bring him back to life. And it doesn't happen that time. And he does it again. And he, said, he prays, God, bring him. He puts his body over his body, bring him back to life. It doesn't happen. He does it again. He prays, God, bring him back to life. God brings the boy back to life. Elijah saw resurrection. He saw provision. He saw miracles. He saw lots of great things. And it built his faith. And he was confident in God. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've seen incredible things. You've seen miracles happen. You've seen God provide for you when you didn't know how he was going to provide for you. But he just came in and he showed up and he did something you never saw coming. And it built your faith. And Elijah, to be honest with you, his faith grew to the point where he got a little cocky. Uh, we could say confident. I think there's a fine line sometimes. How many know what I'm talking about? I think when we read this story on, you'll find out he was confident, but it almost led to the khaki a little bit because there were 400 prophets of Baal that he, he challenged. And he says, you know, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get a bull. You're going to get a bull. We're going to put it on the altar. We're going to call down fire. You can pray. 400 of you pray to your prophet, you know, the, to pray to Baal that he bring fire and set that, that, that bull on fire. And I'll pray to my God and we'll find out who the real God is, you know. That takes some confidence, right? But along the way, when the, those guys were praying to the prophet of Baal and nothing's happening, nothing's happening, he's like, you go first. And nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing. He gets a little cocky. He starts making fun of them. Hey, why don't you yell louder? Why don't you scream? Maybe your God's off taking a leak, relieving himself, is what the Bible says. <laughs> Read your Bibles, people. It's in there. That's a little cocky. But then he, he calls down from heaven fire. But no, he didn't just call fire down. He says, get some jars of water and pour it on the wood that I got there. Oh, that's not enough. We got four jars. You pour it on. Do it again. Do it again. And he drenches this stuff. And there's water. There's like a, a, a trench of water overflowing around it. And then he calls on fire from heaven. And, and God sets it on fire. And everybody understands that God is the one true living God. He's seen some stuff happen. He's got the title prophet. He's a pretty special, anointed, spirit-filled, on-fire dude. Lots of confidence in the Lord. And he does this great miracle. And he gets back to this woman, the king's wife named Jezebel, and she says, I'm going to kill you. And he runs scared like a little weenie and hides under a tree. Can you say that in church? He does. Yeah, just did. <laughs> but come on, that's what he does. And I read this story, I'm going, how in the world did he end up at that place? Are you with me? How do you get from that guy to this guy? And I'm not claiming I've ever been on a spiritual level of Elijah, except for the fact that we have the same father. And I had the same salvation. I'm going to the same heaven that he's in right now. <laughs> so maybe we are a little closer than I think. But, but you know what? I've been that person who's been here on the mountain. And, and I, yeah, I'm not, I was never too naive to think that I wouldn't go through some stuff in life. Because we all go through stuff. We all got that. We can all agree on that. But I never thought I'd be that guy sitting in that dark place, okay with not living anymore. But Elijah was there. What about you? See, this is the kind of stuff we don't want to talk about in church. 
Matter of fact, some lady in this room, I don't know who you are. And, uh, I'm just saying, I'm just somebody. I'm telling you, you were here the last time I preached, and you thought, yeah, we're coming for a nice faith-filled message. And this is not what you came for today. <laughs> I mean, you know, we don't always get what we want, but sometimes God wants to give, God always wants to give us what we need. I think there's probably somebody in this room with this many people, there's no doubt in my mind, but there's at least one, two, and maybe more that you found yourself in a deep, dark place and you never saw it coming. Your spouse never saw it coming. Your family and friends didn't see it coming because they saw you like that. They knew you as that person of faith. You were the person that they talked to when they were down to get encouragement. But now you're the person who needs to be encouraged in your faith and in your life. What do you do when you end up in that place? Here's what I want to tell you today. It's a message I think the church needs to hear. When I say the church, I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about the body of Christ. It's okay to not be okay. But I'm going to tell you something. As believers in Jesus Christ, as followers, as people that have given our life to him and surrendered to him, Satan wants to tell you different. And he wants to tell you that you not being okay isn't okay. I'm here to tell you today that is a lie from the enemy. And somebody today needs to know that you're okay. Even though right now, you're not okay. Because it's okay not to be okay. So why do we find so many places, churches, where people gather where it seems opposite of that? Why, does it, why is it that the world has to feel like they got to be something special to come to church? That they have to have their stuff together. That you have to put on the mask and say, I'm blessed and highly favored. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> I'm screwed up and don't know what I'm going to do. That's how I'm doing. Right? But we come to church and we pretend and we put on these masks and we got to act like it's, it's a certain way. Because you know why? Because oftentimes the church isn't accepting of people that aren't okay. Let me remind you, we've all sinned. You're a sinner. Yeah, isn't that special? We've all been there. We've had doubts in our faith. We've struggled with things called depression. We've wandered away. We've all been hypocrites at times. You say, Pastor, that's not me. Well, the Bible calls you a liar, so, you know, deal with that. But we come to church and we think that everybody has to be okay. I want to tell you something. It's okay to not be okay at times, but hear me today. God doesn't want you to stay that way. God did not want me to stay in that closet hiding. Because had I stayed in that closet, I wouldn't be here speaking to somebody who needs to hear it today. Are you hearing me? It's okay not to be okay, but God doesn't want to keep you that way. So it's not okay to stay that way. So what do you do in that place? First of all, I want to tell you something. You're not alone. It might be the person next to you might be in the same place. They're just hiding it. But chances are you're not alone. And no matter where you're at today, God loves you. Matter of fact, God doesn't love you. Listen to me. Somebody needs to hear this. God still loves you. He still loves you. 
despite how you feel about yourself right now, he's crazy about you. You're his child. You're so special to him. You mean so much to him that he gave his son for you to die in your place. He's crazy about you. Despite how you're feeling about yourself. My kids do stupid things. Drives me crazy. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about. You ever like just see your kid do something? Some of us, you, you know the kids I got now, what you, most of you don't know is we've got a 34-year-old. You say, how did that happen? Well, none of our kids were biological, but we started off with a 15-year-old right in, early on in marriage. So that's a whole different story. So he's out in Montana with his beautiful family, and they're coming to visit us here in a couple of weeks, all right? But when this boy was a teenager, I remember there were times he, oh my gosh, he could make my head spin. Like the time that he drove out of the driveway and he attached himself to my brand new Craftsman mower and he drug it down the street behind his car. When I came out to mow again, I walk out of the house and I'm just like. <laughs> and I stood there speechless. How do you not know you're doing this? Well, because the stereo was just thumping too loud. And I watched the wheels of that new mower go ding, ding. And it just falling apart without, it was just. And I just look at it and I'm like, what is your problem? We went through so much with that boy. But I'm so excited that he's coming to see me here in a couple of weeks and his family, his beautiful family. And uh, we, we took him in. He's actually my brother-in-law. It's Tracy's brother. And so we started with him, but we have more of a parental relationship with him. So he's going to bring, bring my uh, grandchildren, I guess, my niece and nephew. It's weird. They call me Grunkle Jeff. That means grandpa and uncle all at the same time. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other grunkles out there in the world, but that's who I am. And I'm so excited to see them, even though there were times that, you know what, he was just an idiot. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God still wants to see us, even though there are times that we've been crazy stupid? We've done stuff that, that God's probably looking like, really? But nothing's separating you from his love. He still loves you. You're in a bad place today. He still loves you. You're not okay today. He still loves you. You've drifted. He still loves you. It's okay not to be okay. The church should be a place where people can come and not be okay. Are you? Hear, hear this again. The church needs to be a place for people that aren't okay. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The people that weren't okay. The church needs to be that place. That place of safety where I can come in and be messed up. And I can be in my sin, but I can be forgiven. I can be hurting, but I can be made whole. I can be falling apart, but he can put me together, the great potter, and make me and shape me how he wants me to be. <gasps> Don't you want to be that kind of church? Can somebody say amen? amen. That's the place that this needs to be. And here, if you're in this place today and you're not okay, it's okay. But God doesn't want to keep you that way. I'm not saying, I need to make this clear, I'm not saying sin is okay. Don't, don't be like, oh, Pastor Oscar. <laughs> Pastor Jeff came and he gave us this great message. He said, um, you, know, you know how that sin we've been talking about? He said, it's okay. No, sin's not okay. It's not okay to go into your sin and keep doing it. Matter of fact, Paul says, should I keep on sinning so grace can abound more? Absolutely not. That's not okay. 
But if you're in that place, it's not okay to stay that way. God doesn't want you to stay that way, but this is where you need to be. You need to know that we all go through stuff in our lives. We all screwed up. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You have issues. You have issues. I have issues. I love your pastor and his wife. They got some issues. I'm just telling you, you thought you hired the perfect pastor. <laughs> You're not going to find him. We all got issues. We're all messed up. I don't know if Pastor Oscar's ever hidden out in a dark closet before, but I'm going to tell you, there's stuff. And that's not a bad thing. I'm just saying we're people. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you're not okay, welcome to the human race. I mean, if we were all okay, then why do we need a Savior? Why are we here today? Why are we wasting our time? The church needs to be a place for people that aren't okay because we need Jesus. But God doesn't want to keep us that way. And I'm so grateful for that. So I've just told you a little bit of my story, and I'm trying to be sensitive to time because I want to, I want to just get through a few more things, but, but I'll tell you this. I mean, it didn't end there. It was, it was messed up. I mean, I was so messed up, and, and I'm just amazed today that, that I, I'm still married. <laughs> I'm still doing ministry, and that God is blessing and, and, and doing some things in our life because I was at a point where I never thought that could happen. I was at a point where I never thought I would recover from that dark place. So what do you do? I want to talk to you today. If you're that person in this place today and you're not okay, don't make excuses about it. You see, a lot of stuff plays into why we end up where we are. Don't, don't justify it. Well, Pastor Jeff, you don't know the family I grew up in. What, your family's crazy? So is mine. I got a family member that, oh, I shouldn't even go there. See, that's what I'm just saying. I won't even go there. I'm just telling you, we got crazy in our family, but so do you, I guarantee you. You look back far enough, and if you, don't, if you can't figure out who that crazy person is, <laughs> I'm talking about the man in the mirror. Uh. We all got crazy, don't we? So don't make excuses about it. You don't have to be that person anymore. You can be the one who breaks the curse in your family. You can be the one who does things a little bit different. You can be the one that, that raises your children different than you were raised. Make excuses. We can make excuses about it. We're not, I could make excuses about how my dad never spent time with me, never did anything with me, wasn't involved in my life, or I can be the best daddy I can be to my kids. I could make excuses why I struggled with addiction to pornography. Because my uncle thought it would be really cool at, at a, when I was just a little kid to introduce me, to take me, to buy me a bunch of porn and teach me to masturbate. Can we talk about that in church? If you want to go to a fake church, don't have me back. I mean, I love you. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, no disrespect when I say that. I don't want to be cocky. But I do want to be real. And we could make excuses about, well, that's just, all, you know, that's just the way it is because it's not my fault because that's what I was introduced to. You know, people walked out on me and abandoned me, you know, so I don't know how to, how to have relationships. We can be in these spots while I was in this dark place and I was screwed up. And we can make up all these excuses, you know. And yeah, I might be a little abusive, but man, if you knew what I went through, I'm not as bad as they are. Or we come to church. Ooh, that's a good one. And yeah, Pastor, I have issues. Yeah, they have issues. You don't believe you have issues? Your spouse can tell you, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Your friends and family can tell you. You don't believe you're that person, but, but, but you are to some degree. And I don't know where you're at, but maybe in this place where you're not okay. But here's the deal. Don't make excuses about it. Let God do something in your life. Let him transform you. Let him make you into what he wants you to be. But sometimes you've got to get over it. You've got to decide to get past it. And here's what I, I'm going to, man, I'm going to mess with some thinking today. And some of you may not even like me anymore after I'm done. 
And I hope that's not the case because I do like to be liked. I mean, who doesn't, right? But we come to church sometimes and we have this issue about not being okay. And then when we're not okay, we say, well, we're just going to pray for you. And once we pray for you, everything's going to be good. You're going to be healed. You're going to be saved. You're going to be transformed. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to be delivered. Life will be good. And if it's not, then we look down on you because you're not okay. But sometimes it's a process. I'm just telling you the truth today. It's a process. And you've got to walk that out. So I want to encourage you to start walking out the process that God has to set you free. The process that he has in place for your life to get you to a better place. But I want to tell you, he wants you in a better place. It may be okay not to be okay, but he doesn't want to keep you that way. He didn't want to see you stay that way. He came to give you your best life possible, life more abundantly. He came to do something more than you can even imagine in your life. He doesn't want you to stay that way. So start working out that process. What does that mean, pastor? How? I want to encourage you today to stop beating yourself up and start getting up. Because I beat myself up for a long time. I didn't need any more critics. I was a good enough one myself. I have plenty of them out there. Trust me, I do. <laughs> yeah. But I was my biggest. And you might be here today and internally, you've been beating yourself up. Today, God wants you to stop beating yourself up, and he wants you to start getting back up. But it might be a little bit of a process. Let me talk to you about that for just a few moments before we're done here. You see, I never saw it coming where I was at. I doubt that when Elijah was calling down fire from heaven, he saw himself being under that broom tree down the road. I, thought, I think he thought he had the world by the tail. You know, I can do anything. I conquer anything because God is for me. Who can be against me? I'm on fire. You know, that's probably where he's at. And he never thought, saw himself being that guy, depressed and under a tree. But when he ended up in that place, here's what the Bible tells us God did. God showed up and he said, get up. He was so depressed, he fell asleep under the tree in his depression. I remember that. I spent hours in bed during the day just because I was depressed. I was there. And God said, get up. Eat something. Check this out. Wouldn't it have been great if he got up and he made himself a turkey sandwich? Put some mayo on there and lettuce and tomato and a little red onion. And, and he ate that sandwich and life was good. Wouldn't that be great? Elijah had to respond to God. And Elijah responded to God and he got up and he ate something. And you know what he did after that? He went back to bed. But the process began. The process of renewing his strength, the process of getting back to, to being well and healthy and who he was again, it began. And then God says, get up again and eat something because you're going to need it for the journey I'm taking you on, for where you're going to go. You're going to need renewed strength. That renewed strength came in the form of rest it came in the form of nourishment and, and, and food. Can I tell you? I don't know what your issue to, today is, but I can tell you this. For every single one of us, we need to find our rest in the Lord. And we need to renew ourselves in him. We need to take on nourishment once again. See, when you find yourself in that dark place or you find yourself lost in your sin or you find yourself, you know, in your dysfunction and your hatred or your bitterness or your anger or your unforgiveness or whatever it is, here's where you don't find yourself. You're not finding yourself in the presence of God being nourished. 
And so God's telling him, get up and do something. And you know what he had to do? He had to respond. He responded to God. I want to encourage you to be that person who responds to God. Well, how am I going to know? How is God going to show up, you know, Pastor? Because he may not just send an angel to me like he did Elijah. And, and, and he may not tell me to get up. And he may not, you know, say make a sandwich. You know, it, it may not look like that. Chances are it won't look like that. And here's what you need to know. And a lot of times it won't look at all like you expect it to. Elijah learns that a little bit later. God says, go wait for me. A little later in the chapter, he says, wait, I'm going to come by. And we're going to have this little talk or whatever, but wait for me. And the Bible says that, that Elijah experienced some things. He experienced uh, some wind. And he thought, well, that might be God. No, it wasn't God. He experienced earthquake. That wasn't God either. He experienced fire. God wasn't in the fire. Some of you have heard this story before. But when nothing happened like he expected, there was a whisper. And he experienced God in the whisper, and God showed up in a way that he didn't expect him to. And maybe God's going to show up just like this today. He's going to send a guy from Adel, Iowa, here. And he's going to speak to you today, and you didn't expect that to happen. Maybe he's going to whisper in your ear, I still love you. I know you've been far from me. I know you've drifted. I know you're not where you want to be. And I know you're not where I want you to be. But I want you to come home. I prepared a place for you, a celebration. I'm waiting for you to come home. He's just whispering, today's your day to come back. And will you be at that place you once were right away? Maybe not. You may go back to bed. But then you get back up again. And you allow God to strengthen you and nourish you. And he will show up in a way that you don't expect. But you need to respond to him. Let me show, tell you what God did for me. My wife and I got invited to a dinner for all these pastors. I was still pastoring in the midst of all this craziness. And uh, we got invited to this deal. There was going to be this guy from Michigan, and he wanted to talk to us about his ministry. And hey, was I so interested in that? No, but I was interested in the free meal at this nice restaurant. <laughs> so we went. We showed up, and I said, hey, I want to get a good meal out of this, you know. And so we showed up, and my wife and I were the only ones to show up. The only pastor and his wife. Awkward. And so we show up and we have this meal. And this guy starts unpacking his story. Guy from Michigan. That God just set this whole thing up divinely to send the right person along my path. And he starts just talking about his life and his experiences and where he was. And I'm sitting across the table and I start to cry. Because I was hearing a guy describe me. And he said, Jeff, let's do lunch tomorrow. Okay. So we just went out for lunch the next day. He said, Jeff, I want to ask you a question. Do you think you're depressed? <coughs> I had a little bit of pride. No. I don't think so. I mean, I hope I'm not. I don't want to be. He said, I want you to go home and go out to the a national association, I think it was, for mental health. And there's a survey about clinical depression. There are like 10 things. You answer them yes or no. If you answer, I think, six yeses then you're, or more, you're considered clinically depressed. I answered eight out of the 10 yes. So according to this national standard, I was a clinically depressed person. I wasn't suicidal. That was one I didn't answer yes. And there was another one I didn't answer yes. I don't remember what that was. So that was the first thing God did. He sent a guy from Michigan into my path, a guy named uh, John. He sent Dr. Jennifer across my path, and she helped me. I sat across from this doctor in a place that, again, I felt like such an idiot. I felt like there's, 
I didn't belong. I felt like, how did I get to this point that I'm sitting across from this lady doctor that I've never met before, and I'm crying, and I want to give up on my marriage, and I want to give up on my church and pastor and everything I want to do. And she said to me, which I think God used her to say this to me, Jeff, you're not in a good place right now. Don't make any major decisions in your life. You need help. we got to get you right back to where you need to be. I'm going to tell somebody this in this room today. Don't make any big decision right now if you're in that spot. Because God doesn't want you to stay in that place. So just hold on. So what do you do in the waiting? What do you do in the midst of all this? Understand that God will show up, maybe in a way that you don't expect, but be receptive. Be looking for him to show up and be receptive. Respond to him. Elijah had to respond. He had to get up. I think about, I thought about getting up this morning with this whole deal. And I remember the other day, my wife, I was, she was sitting in a chair, I think, outside. And we were sitting out really late on our partially finished deck. And because how many know that's kind of exciting when it's partially done to even sit out there. You're missing boards right in front of you. Don't dare step that way. But you can sit right here and pretend it's all done. And so we were up, man, having one of those really late husband-wife conversations, you know. And we, we didn't get to bed at like 1 o'clock in the morning, I think, that day. And then she got up, and she's like, help me up. And so I put out my hand to help her up. I extended my hand to her, and, and I started to pull. But I didn't pull her, and she said, pull harder. And I'm thinking, you've got to do a little bit of this work yourself. <laughs> Are you hearing me? I mean, come on, Brian, you sit on the floor today, and you ask me to pull you up. You better give it a little bit of effort, man. Otherwise, you can stay there. <laughs> Right? I want to tell you, for some of you, God is going to reach out, and he's ready to just pull you out of that, but you've got to make a little bit of effort. Okay? And you take it one day at a time, one step at a time, and all along the way, you have faith believing that God doesn't want to keep me this way, but I'm going to get to a better place. You just believe that. You do what you got to do. You've got to respond to God. Stop beating yourself up and start getting up. I just want to end with this little thought here in just a moment. Listen, Romans says this. There's no more condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation if you belong to Christ. We sing a song. It's jumped out of me about belonging to him. I don't even remember what the song was. But I remember in the lyrics, it says that I belong to him. If you belong to him, there's no condemnation. Jesus isn't sitting here waiting to condemn you. He loves you, and he wants to help you to get to a better place. So if you belong in him, the condemnation comes from the enemy. But if you're feeling that, know that, you know what, you don't have to beat yourself up because Jesus isn't trying to beat you up. He's wanting to help you get back up. And sometimes it's a process. I want to just talk just a few minutes more about that process. Because in church, sometimes we think that forgiveness is instantaneous. It is on Jesus' part, but how many have had to forgive somebody over and over and over again? You have to work that out, right? I mean, I had to forgive my uncle for some stuff, but that took some time. It's true. My wife had to forgive me of some stuff because I was an ugly man for a while. I mean, this took me to a bad place in every area of my life. And, and it really messed us up. I mean, we had to go to counseling. Matter of fact, we got an appointment coming up here not too long from now. How's that for honest? You know why? Because I'm not embarrassed that I got issues. Because I got a God who wants to help us work through our issues. Can we just become a church where we're real and understand it's okay not to be okay? But we're all on this journey of getting better because we have a God who doesn't want to keep us that way. And so you go through that process. You may be here today and you say, well, I've been believing God for a healing and a miracle and it hasn't happened yet. Sometimes it's a process. I start to prepare to preach and the Lord just brings all these little things to my mind. How many have got scars on your body? I've got scars where there, I've been wounded and I've had to be healed. Sometimes it's taken months. 
sometimes, it, you know, I look back and I think, man, it was a process. It was a process of putting that, that Neosporin on or whatever. It was a process of flushing it out. I had a motorcycle wreck, ripped all the skin off my arm and went to therapy. And uh, it's completely healed. You can't even tell that I ever had a problem. But it was a process. A few things I want you to get out of this message. I'm not saying that it's okay to sin. That's wrong. I'm saying God still loves you and will forgive you and doesn't want to keep you in your sin. I'm not saying that God can't heal you instantaneously. I've seen him do it. I've also seen God for reasons I don't understand and sometimes I've seen later make it a process before people get that healing. I've seen people walk through hurt and I've been that person myself and it took me some time to get over it and get healed from it. But God still healed me. Can we be a church that loves one another through the process? How did I get back through that? I want to tell you something, because I had a church that I stood up in front of, and I just got real with. And I said, your pastor screwed up. <laughs> and I apologized to my church, and I said, I don't mean to offend you. If it looks like sometimes you're talking to me and I don't care. If it looks like sometime I'm checked out and on another planet because I am, I apologize to them and I said, you know what? There are most weeks I don't even know how I can get up here and preach. It's only by the grace of God that I'm able to do it. And I said, this is where I'm at and this is where we are in our marriage. But God isn't calling me away from this, even though I wish he would. <laughs> and you know what they did? They loved us. He loved us through the process of God getting us to a place where we are okay again. New life, Ryan Beck. Can I just encourage you to be that kind of church? Be that church. Love people to restoration. Love them to the place where they get to where God wants them to be. Let them know it's not okay. I mean, that it's okay not to be okay, but let them know that God doesn't want to keep them that way. And you're going to help them to get to where they need to be. If you're in this room today, and this message is for you, you may need to get help. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to mess with some people more because I think Pastor Oscar knows my heart. I think he'll let me come back. <laughs> but I'm just going to say things of the church I think the church needs to hear. I've sat in services where people have condemned people for being depressed from behind the pulpit. talk down because they're on medication and they haven't been healed yet. But there might be somebody in this room, you're taking your heart meds. Somebody probably took a blood pressure pill before you came to church today. How many know your mind is a part of your body? And I'm a person that believes the word of God and know that he can renew and change our minds. But I'm not too naive to think that, you know, we may not need a little help or that it's just all going to happen instantaneously because if it is, then why do you still take those pills? Why do you still do what you do? So I've been on a lot of different prescriptions and I took my meds before I came here today. And be, let me tell you something, you should probably be glad I did. You think, man, I'm, this guy gets a little wound up. You should see me when I'm off my meds. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a process. And I'm still walking out that process. But check this out. This is what's real. real. Well, that's a bigger step than I thought. This is. <laughs> that's going to be a great video clip right there. <laughs> if you ever put together a church bloopers clip, that's one for you. You're welcome. <laughs> I 
told you I was screwed up and had issues. <laughs> but check this out today. Listen, listen to this right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close up. But I stand before you a guy who's been a sinner and who still sins sometimes. I stand before you a guy who's broken and still needs fixing. Who has hurts, that has pains. But I stand before you today a guy for whom is in Christ and I belong to him. And now the old is gone and the new has begun. Yeah, I love the way the NLT reads. It says the new has begun. Begun. It's a process. It's a renewing day after day, being made new one step at a time. For me, I would sit down day after day and just proclaim that God was going to heal my marriage. God was going to heal my heart. God was going to help me day after day. I would journal about the little wins that I would journal about. Matter of fact, some, that's a journal. That journal reads a lot better than my other journals. Because I have journal upon journal that, are, that, that, that is a horror story in my life. But along the way, you see the redemptive work of God. You see him working out a process of restoration and healing and renewal in my life. Because God didn't want to leave me in that place. And now... And now I get to stand before you today with a joy in my heart that I never thought I would have again. Because I realized that God takes broken people just like me. And he loves me. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of me or how you think. My wife said, Jeff, how come you never talk about, you know, addiction to pornography? You know, if you're free of that, why don't you talk about it? Because of shame. What if they knew about me? What if they knew who I was and what I did in my life? All that kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter what they think anymore because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And now I get to walk in freedom and soak in you. And in the midst of wherever you're at today... God's using me right now. And I don't say that cocky or arrogant, but I get to take a message to somebody who needs to hear it today. So you're sitting here today and you're saying, but I'm so messed up. God, what can you do with me? Just say, God, I'm available to do what you want today and tomorrow. And God, I'm going to trust you to continue to work on me and mold me and make me into the man and the woman that you want me to be. I'm going to trust you to do something new in my life. Because if any man is in Christ, the new has begun. Stop beating yourself up. Start getting up. Church, it's okay to not be okay. But God doesn't want to leave you that way. Amen. Stand with me this morning. I listened to the song that we're about to sing on YouTube this morning in my hotel room. And I think it's very fitting for this message. So here's what we're going to do. I just want you, in the same spirit that we took communion today, not super formal, I just want you to spend time with your Heavenly Father, what that looks like for you. When I was going through my stuff, I had well-meaning Christians come pray for me. hope we can handle this in here today, but I'm going to tell you that this is the honest truth. 
If you want honesty, it's what you're going to get with me. And maybe it's too much for church. And, but I was the pastor who found myself at the altar, and I had people come up there pray for me. In my mind, I'm saying to myself, honest truth, I'm saying, get the, your hands the hell off of me. That's where I was. I didn't want to be messed with. I didn't want to be touched. I didn't want anything. But what I did know is I needed Jesus. I needed Jesus in my ugly moments. I needed Jesus when I wasn't okay and when I wasn't right. So today, I don't know what you need, but I know a Savior who does. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to pray with me? That's cool. But I want you to talk to Jesus. I want you to let him speak to you. And if you need somebody who gets you, or will try anyways to pray with you, I'll be happy to pray with you. But this is how it's going to work. Let me know you want me to pray for you. But whatever you do, don't leave this place without just talking to God about where you are and getting real. Listening for him to speak to you in a way that maybe you don't expect. And then respond to him reaching out to you. And give it time. For somebody, it may be instantaneous. I don't doubt the instantaneous work of God. But here's what we need to know in the church. Sometimes it's a process. And just start walking out that process one day at a time. And if you will do that in Christ... I guarantee you, you can get back to a better place. Matter of fact, not just back, I believe he'll take you farther than you ever imagined you could go. I promise you that. Let's pray, and then we're going to sing this song, and we're going to close with this song, and you just connect with your Heavenly Father in the way that you need to do it. And if you would like prayer with somebody, Here's what we're going to do. Then I'm just going to invite you. If you want prayer with somebody, I'm just going to invite you to come all the way to the front. All the way to the front. front, And we'll pray with you today. Heavenly Father, I've done what I believe you have brought me here to do and said what you wanted us to hear today. So Holy Spirit of God, I just trust you with the response today. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you speak hope into a situation that seems hopeless. I pray that you just lift somebody's burden a little bit today. Let them know that you still love them, that you care for them, that you're there for them right now. And you're going to help get them to a better place in you, in you. In your name, Jesus. Amen.